When it started filming a few years ago, the new prime video drama Expats, which is about a group of wealthy expats residing in Hong Kong, generated a lot of criticism. When celebrity Nicole Kidman came in August 2021, the city's severe COVID-19 quarantine regulations were waived, which infuriated the locals. The uneasy optics of filming a high-profile drama about wealthy foreigners in Hong Kong at the same time that the government persisted in suppressing civil rights following widespread demonstrations were also observed by the local media. It's a little disheartening to say that those controversies are considerably more fascinating than the actual show now that the six-part limited series has premiered. Despite a standout performance by co-star Soraya Blue, Expats, which is based on Janice Y.K. Lee's novel The Expatriates, is a grand-looking character study that is meditative to the point of soporific. The first episode lingers in the present. The opening sequence sets the tone and centers on a sumptuous 50th birthday celebration thrown for Margaret's Nicole Kidman husband, Clark Brian T. Following a horrible family accident that resulted in one of Margaret and Clark's children going missing, the celebration has been planned. The three women at the center of the storied expats begin to reveal to us at the party that they have a strange previous relationship. The story opens with Mercy's voice telling us about a string of tragic incidents that don't seem to be connected to the story at all. These include the story of a doctor who fell asleep at the wheel and used her car to hide several pedestrians, the story of a group of pilots whose plane crashed into a ski lift, and the story of a young boy who one day paralyzed his twin brother while they were play fighting. Mercy expresses her desire to learn more about people like me, the people who caused the tragedies. Do they ever receive forgiveness? Do they ever find new love? She is obviously very sorry about anything that happened in the past. The scene then cuts to Margaret in a restaurant, having a conversation with Priscilla about the specifics of Clark's birthday celebration while her two kids, Daisy and Philip, wait for her to finish. Her son Philip has sketched a picture of his entire family, including a small boy standing away from the others in a taller figure. When Priscilla asks who the boy it is, he replies that it's Gus. Margaret then quickly notifies the party planner that they must go immediately. Hillary, Margaret's friend, who has been estranged from her, comes back from a run and gets into the elevator at the peak apartment complex. When she notices Margaret is back, she tries to send the elevator up to get away from them, but Daisy and Philip rush down the hallway and stop the doors. Margaret enters and inquires about Hillary and her husband David's attendance at the celebration, noting how much it would mean to Clark if they did. Hillary first replies that they are unable to attend, but she will check to see if they can still drop by. The atmosphere in Margaret's flat is tense. Margaret wants the party to go ahead in order to bring things a bit more normal, but Clark's mother, Jane, is adamant that it was a horrible idea and should have been postponed. Philip is also told not to drunk us again after she confronts him about the figure next to him in his drawing, to which he responds that it is Jesus. Then we are reintroduced to Mercy, who is having an affair with David, also known as Dirk, who turns out to be Hillary's husband. Following his departure, she goes out for drinks with some friends, who question her about Dirk, even though she insists they're not serious at all. While out, she receives a text from him, so she heads off to work at one of her catering jobs, serving appetizers at Margaret's party, to be exact. When Hillary and David argue in the car on the way to the party, David says he can't do this anymore, and asks the driver to pull over, leaving Hillary alone for the evening. Margaret, Clark, and David also get prepared for the celebration. As the celebration goes on, tensions between Margaret and Clark's parents get worse. As Mercy is serving, she spots Margaret's children, looks at the parents, gets alarmed, and gets ready to leave the building. Margaret seeks to find Mercy after spotting her in turn. Before Margaret can grab Priscilla for the speeches, Margaret scolds her for inviting her to the celebration. Clark thanks their friends and family for attending and for their support over the past year, after Gus's disappearance, in front of all the guests. Standing next to some other visitors, Hillary realizes she can't face Margaret, as she is right now, and walks out. Margaret informs Clark that she saw Mercy, and he tries in vain to comfort her that Mercy couldn't have been among the masses. Margaret doesn't waver and charges the floor to confront a different waitress that she mistakenly believes to be Mercy. Margaret is once again approached by Clark's family after Mercy departs the event, throwing up behind it as they go, and they inquire as to why Mercy would have been anywhere close. After receiving a text regarding the altercation, Hillary goes back to see how her friend is doing. In the end, the two jump into a cab together and decide to stop for lunch on the way home. 
There, they not only share some exciting news but also look back on their past exploits. Margaret seems to be harboring a growing desire to leave her family since she detests being perceived as the mother of a missing kid, and Hillary confides in her that she believes her marriage is ended. Following a lighthearted moment spent dancing to music, Margaret asks Hillary to drive her to the market where Gus vanished. The cops are outside the peak when they return later. Hillary leaves to see what's wrong as Margaret becomes immediately alarmed that something has happened to another of her children. It appears that one of their neighbors has also died. After a heated discussion about Hillary's failing marriage on the elevator, Margaret and Hillary part ways. When Hillary gets back to her empty house, Puri, her assistant, tells her that David hasn't been there. After then, the episode returns to Margaret's apartment. Philip looks for the family drawing while she and Clark are talking about their neighbor's passing. He retrieves it from a container and uses magnets to place it back on the refrigerator. The second installment of Lulu Wang's Expats brings us back to the beginning with a fateful meeting that resulted in a defining tragedy, following the show's meandering premiere that revealed a musical mystery. Wang creates a unique ambience for the setting once more with a view of birds soaring overhead against a dazzling sun and the sounds of running kids. It's a nice, almost fleeting sense. Finally, we see Gus, a cute, mischievous ball of energy, at an opulent party on a yacht in Mongkok, as he dashes past the affluent guests and onto a cliff. Mercy doesn't fit in in a sea of trust fund brats. She's the strange poor kid again, but Margaret likes her right away because of the way she plays with Gus and treats his elder siblings with grace. Mercy interprets this as a potential job offer and makes some hinting, while Margaret responds politely but evasively. A quick wide image of the whole family, including Gus, Margaret, Daisy, Philip, and Clark, as Mercy weaves Daisy's hair, looks like a family postcard. This conversation not only defines the episode's central socioeconomic relationships, but it also clearly lays the stage for what later happens to Gus. When it comes to handling domestic help, Margaret, who believes she is wiser and gentler than her wealthy expat friends, is on the same wavelength as wealthy expat parents and wealthy families that can afford full-time nannies in general, a dynamic also seen in Alfonso Curran's Roma. She has a blind spot that extends to the blurred boundaries that already exist at home with her Filipino maid, Essie, Ruby Ruiz, who has been living with and working for the family since Gus was born and has a particularly close bond with him. Mercy offers to help, but she doesn't recognize it as an employment inquiry. Even though Margaret never expresses it out, her nervous stare at their close-knit, loving mother-son relationship reveals a past insecurity of hers that she later discusses with Hillary. Gus even speaks a little bit of Filipino. Even though she constantly tells other foreigners that Essie is like family, there is a part of her that wishes this weren't the case. In actuality, she finds it uncomfortable that these other ladies are referring to Margaret as Essie's employer, a reality that she takes as callousness. Margaret acknowledges in the conversation with Hillary that during her pregnancy with Gus, she didn't want another kid. Eventually, her feelings did shift, but even though she admitted her concern, it was done so with a bitter dramatic irony that would be expected in a chronological narrative. She remarks, almost like I was wishing him away. David, like Margaret, makes an effort to keep his staff members friendly. But the lack of reciprocation when David talks too much about personal problems with his driver, Sam, emphasizes this typical eagerness of the wealthy expat, ignoring the fact that the working class needs to stay out of these intricate webs of legal entanglements in order to maintain their jobs, jobs being the operative word here. The presence of cleaners and chauffeurs is more of a lifestyle convenience than a business arrangement for David and Clark, who are debating staying in Hong Kong longer when they receive a new contract. Sam and David's lack of communication also highlights David's loneliness and his need for guidance, approval, or even just a straightforward discussion about starting a family, a significant decision on which he and Hillary not only disagree but also fail to address this difference in communication. Even though none of them seems to want to acknowledge it, the marriage is a husk. Margaret urges Essie to stay at home when Clark abruptly cancels a family dinner. She advises her to take the evening off, but given her previous jealousy, the choice may not be selfless. Margaret then extends an invitation to Mercy. The question of whether this meeting is amicable, a trial job, or, as Margaret puts it, a favor causes awkwardness for Mercy as she assists with child care. She texts a friend to inquire about whether she should be billing for her time and when to bring up the topic of money since Margaret doesn't seem to understand Mercy's situation. Unfortunately, Margaret ends up talking to her buddy for just long enough at a night market to forget where Gus is. A surprised and guilty Mercy approaches an angry and dejected Clark, 
who consoles Margaret, so overcome with grief that she covers her face, as the police attempt to find leads, but they do not speak. Their stillness has a greater dramatic impact than any conversational exchange could. Which of these personalities would even say anything? The episode closes with a brief repeat of a scenario from the first episode, in which Margaret and Hillary visit the same mag market, a moment in time and location that is now painfully placed in a new context, and with David coming to help and bringing Mercy home. This is how they first met. The buildings and streets are no longer shimmering this time. We watch as their surfaces are routinely cleansed, erasing and making anonymous the suffering we have just witnessed. Aerial cuts abruptly transport us to various hours of the day, giving the impression that the street is just any other place where hundreds of people go about their daily lives. It seems as though Gist and his tail had either completely disappeared or never existed in the first place.